All right, welcome. We're in the book By What Standard, the an analysis of the philosophy of Cornelius Van Til. Not an easy, but uh, clearly a very important read. All right, so where are we? We're in chapter four, the psychology of religion integration into the void. 16 pages of meaty meat. So why don't we, without further ado, Hit the record button and go. Four, the psychology of religion, integration into the void. Since 1890, but with admitted roots in Kant and Schleiermacher, the psychology of religion has become a new area of knowledge and study and also a new form of attack on Orthodox Christianity Accordingly, Van Til has given it special attention, for here, in an ostensibly scientific manner, religion is studied without metaphysical and epistemological presuppositions. Quote, facts, end quote, are approached directly and allowed to speak for themselves. Such, at any rate, is the mythology of the psychology of religion. Contemporary scholarship, believing itself to be free from the religious setting strings, Contemporary scholarship, believing itself to be free from the religious strings and human myths of past eras, believing itself to be father to pure science and objective knowledge, has perhaps begotten myths as far-reaching as any in history and as naive. According to the psychology of religion, the meaning of religion is to be learned by a study of the religious consciousness of man. Thus, not the creedal statements, Holy books, histories of philosophies of religion are central, nor God himself, nor are a level below. The levels are low, but it's too late now. Or any gods conceivably existing, but rather man in his experience. Supposedly without prejudice, they approach all men of all religious faiths in terms of their religious consciousness, by this very act, however, they presuppose the centrality of the consciousness and make two far-reaching assumptions concerning it. As Van Til has pointed out, first, quote, The metaphysical independence of the self-consciousness of man in general and of the religious consciousness in particular, end quote, underlies the psychology of religion. But, quote, If we are Christians at all, we believe that... <sighs> We believe the creation doctrine, and this makes man dependent upon God metaphysically. End quote. Second, it is assumed that quote, the self consciousness of man in general and of his religious consciousness in particular end quote, has an ethical independence from God. But as Christians, we must assert that the doctrine of sin makes man dependent upon God while ethically alienated from him. The psychology of religion attempts to study religion from the, quote, inside, end quote, and not from the, quote, outside, end quote. Traditional theology is accused of studying religion from the outside, while the psychology of religion, in concentrating on the religious consciousness, studies it from the inside. This, as Van Til shows, is a most significant presupposition. It is assumed that the objective reference to religion is of secondary or of no significance, that God, or whatever gods exist, is not as central or as much, quote, inside, end quote, the area of significance and meaning as man's consciousness. Religion is thus assumed to be basically man-centered rather than God-centered. Before a single fact was studied, therefore, a metaphysics has been presupposed. Moreover, in assuming that the religious consciousness and the world of phenomena constitutes the proper area of study and knowledge, an epistemology is presupposed. Thus, before the quote-unquote science of the psychology of religion begins to operate, an extensive metaphysics and epistemology in terms of autonomous man is assumed which predetermines what shall constitute a fact. 
While formally originating in the 1890s and descending from Kant and Schleiermacher, the psychology of religion can, as Van Til asserts, be traced back to paradise and to Eve. When Eve listened to Satan's temptation to be as God and to, quote, know, end quote, and determine metaphysics and ethics in terms of her own consciousness, she submitted to the claim and assertion that her created consciousness could best know itself, reality and her religious consciousness if she cut herself loose from God. Only then would a fair and open-minded knowledge be possible. The outside witness is denied validity. To assume that religion has reference to God and that man's consciousness as a created consciousness can have no meaning apart from God and his will is regarded as being unscientific. The truth or falsity of religion becomes increasingly irrelevant. The significant area is inside, in the human consciousness. The religious consciousness must be... Yep, 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 yep. The religious consciousness must be a complete statement within itself. It cannot be dependent on any superhuman or supernatural elements without losing its validity and its scientific nature. God, therefore, can exist only as an aspect of human consciousness and experience. The basic reality is man. Although not all religions... Religious psychologists... Yeah, the levels definitely could be better. Although not all religious psychologists are consistent in maintaining this position, even John Bailey, in commenting on Socrates, is ready to say, quote, We are then doing no more than following the very oldest tradition in this matter if we define the business of theological science as the interrogation of the religious consciousness with a view to discovering what religion is, end quote. Thus, according to Van Til, the psychology of religion first assumes a false neutrality while actually being committed to a metaphysics and epistemology, and second, it assumes that the mind of man is central and can and does act independently of God. Third, it is assumed that the mind of man not only acts independently but is a self-contained entity. All of these are assumptions which should first be established metaphysically and epistemologically, as Van Til comments, quote, We maintain that their starting point makes it incumbent upon them to show us that it is reasonable to suppose that human experience, the human consciousness, has sprung out of the void. Has sprung out of the void. End quote. James Bailey, Pratt. Lübe. Lübe, Lübe, Lübe. Lübe. Leuba, Leuba, Ames and others all assume that which is of necessity, which of necessity. All assume, all assume. All assume that which of necessity they must first prove. Often they candidly admit the arbitrariness of this definition of religion, but only to assert, as does James Bissett Pratt, quote, that this, like all other definitions of religion, is more or less arbitrary, end quote, because they hold to an ultimate philosophical scepticism when it suits their purposes. Because the religious consciousness is determinative for them in defining religion, they will not limit their definition to the Christian consciousness, but work in terms of a general religious consciousness of the human race, including all faiths from all cultures. This is a logical procedure. If the universe is the chance product of a purposeless reality, and the race of man has evolved out of an ocean of bare possibility, then it becomes natural for us to consult the majority to establish the truth. But in terms of such an approach, truth itself becomes remote because man's knowledge of the ocean of bare possibility is too fragmentary for any adequate report on truth. Thus, 
Even the majority opinion of the religious consciousness gives no more than a report on a particular phase of phenomena and nothing more. But if the universe is indeed created by God, then man's religious consciousness, or more accurately, his conscious and subconscious life, are also created by God and bear witness to him. And because man's conscious and subconscious life since the fall is under the influence of sin and ethical alienation from God, it follows that his religious consciousness expresses that alienation in terms of false religion and a man-centered rather than God-centered orientation. To assume the ultimate... To assume the ultimacy of chance, the independence of the human consciousness from God, and the centrality of the consciousness to religion and truth, is to begin not with scientific neutrality, but philosophical and religious prejudice and predetermination of factuality. And this the psychology of religion does. Its method is governed by these myths. As Van Til points out, Position and method go hand in hand. The Christian method always presupposes the existence of God, while the non-Christian method leaves God out of a consideration. While the non-Christian method leaves God out of con- leaves God. while the non-Christian method leaves God out of consideration. In this latter methodology, they study, first, their own experience, second, the religious experience of other living persons, and third, religious autobiographies and writings. The place where we look for evidence reveals clearly what we consider valid evidence to be. Furthermore, as Van Til adds, having determined by their presuppositions what constitutes evidence, they must again employ a standard of values in order to make a critical evaluation of the material at hand. Quote, In this way too, they say they are only applying the general scientific method of modern times, as to the last claim that the psychologist of religion is simply seeking to apply the modern scientific method, there can be no doubt but that this is true. Only, we remark, this is no guarantee that its method is sound. We believe that the modern scientific method itself is suffering from the same disease that we have said the psychologists are suffering from, particularly, namely, they have no well-thought-out conception as to the relation of the universal and the particular, end quote. Thus, the psychologist of religion, while claiming to do away with all bias, and to be neutral in his approach to religion. Mm, I'm gonna to have to squeeze my tongue because that is just a little bit slurred. Slurry bloody. Hockley dockley. And to be neutral in his approach to religion is lacking in sufficient psychological insight to see his own bias and utter lack of neutrality. He believes that he approaches particulars without universals, failing to see that the very particulars he approaches are already predetermined by his universals. Of all mythmakers, none is more naive than modern man. Van Til summarises the method and its presuppositions most tellingly. First, it is assumed that the religious conscious... I'm just not happy about where this microphone is, you know, it's it's much better there. Pop, pop, pop. But the plosives get in the way, if I pull this down, then that's slightly better, but um kind of gets in the way too. Pop, 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 pop. That's much better. First, it is assumed that the religious consciousness is an independent entity. Second, the religious consciousness gives witness to the idea of God, among other things. Third, 
Authentic manifestations of this religious consciousness are to be found everywhere in the world. Fourth, the principles of interpretation used in interpreting this religious consciousness must be deduced entirely from the religious consciousness itself, and only the end product of all this can be seriously called theology in any scientific sense. This method and this alone is regarded as valid because through this alone we are placed directly in touch with objective reality and the religious consciousness is the domain of objective reality. Moreover, this method first of all presupposes that the God of Scripture, the ontological trinity, the self-existent and self-sufficient God, does not exist. No God who establishes the principles of all interpretation by virtue of his creation and his providence is tolerated, but at best a limited God who must deal with an alien universe. The self-sufficiency of God is replaced with the self-sufficiency of the religious consciousness, and this is a point of central importance. In recent years, the psychology of religion has lost its position of an eminent The psychology of religion has lost its position of eminence to existentialism, but the self-sufficiency of the religious consciousness of autonomous man remains as the constant factor on the changing theological scene. And here is metaphysics, even though it parades as scientific neutrality. Second, the Christian distinction between good and evil disappears because evil is made equally ultimate with good and all manifestations of the religious consciousness equally authentic. We might speak of this as an ethics of the ultimacy of evil. Third, it is assumed that nothing is true that cannot be verified in the religious consciousness of every person. Hence, it follows that the special revelations granted to prophets must be excluded because they do not constitute common human experience. Instead of the human consciousness being regarded first as created and second as fallen and hence perverted in its judgments, the human consciousness is made self-sufficient and judge over God. Truth is that which is verifiable in the religious consciousness of Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, animist and everyone. Fourth, the psychology of religion is definitely anti-intellectualistic in that, quote, it seeks to get at religious experience prior to its intellectual interpretation. Yet, it is only through intellectual interpretation that the religious experience can be spoken of to others. End quote. This goes hand in hand with an historic relativism. relativism. Just going to lower that camera down. Why? Because, you know. I want to show off this tie. Pretty awesome. Nice tie. This I got in the Wycliffe Centre in this second hand to it. abandoned by missionaries pile. It's my best tie. I think. My second bit, anyway. This goes hand in hand with an historic relativism. When the psychology of religion claims that the facts are allowed to speak for themselves, it reveals its utter inability to recognize the nature of a fact. If factuality is brute factuality, then, as Van Til points out, all the facts in any historical series have equal value. It becomes impossible for any one historical fact to be given eminence. It becomes impossible for any one historical fact to be given eminence over another or a particular group to be singled out for use. Quote, no standard of judgment could be evolved from a mere historical series. End quote. Moreover, no merely historical series can raise any criterion or value in and by itself. To assume that particulars in a series have relationship one to another in terms of a universal is to assume more than any historical series is capable of giving, 
It is to think metaphysically rather than descriptively. Before the psychologist of religion begins his search for a universal in a particular historical series he designates as his field, he has already presupposed the universal he claims to be intent on discovering. Moreover, he has presupposed also the equal ultimacy of the eternal and the temporal. In this view, as Van Til shows, man becomes an absolutely historical being. His life has no divine frame of reference and created interpretation. As a result, man's life can only be understood by understanding his history, because history alone is the area of meaning, of both particulars and universals. And since the particular supposedly is prior to the universal in this approach, a search for the absolutely individual, the true particular, ensues. Hence, the past becomes important, more so than the future, and the past gives only an endless and never-to-be-completed process and procession of data. Quote, then comes the question, oh, what... I was expecting of... Then comes the question, what history is? Man, as an exclusively historical being, becomes a problem to himself. End quote. All this points towards nothing more than bare description and ultimate subjectivism, towards a relativism which negates all meaning and makes impossible a solution to the one and many problem. Against all this, Christianity offers, as Van Til points out, a solution to the one and many problem and an answer to the historical problem created by relativism. First of all, basic to the Christian view is the metaphysical presupposition involved in the doctrine of creation that God is an absolutely self-conscious and self-sufficient being, an absolute personality, triune in nature and the solution of the one and many problem. Quote, there is no remnant of unconsciousness or potentiality in the living of... <laughs> That's all. There is no remnant of unconsciousness or potentiality in the being of God, end quote, because, quote, the persons of the Trinity are mutually exhaustive, end quote. Quote, Thus, there cannot be anything unknown to God that springs from his own nature. Then, too, there was nothing existing beyond this God before the creation of the universe. Hence, the time-space world cannot be a source of independent particularity. The space-time universe cannot even be a universe of exclusive particularity. It is brought forth by the creative act of God, and this means, in accordance with the plan of the universal of God, Hence, there must be in this world universals as well as particulars. Moreover, they can never exist in independence of one another. They must be equally ultimates, which means, in this case, that they are both derivative. Now, inasmuch as this is the case, God cannot be conf... Now, inasmuch as this is the case, God cannot be confronted by an absolute particularity that springs from the space-time universe any more than he can be confronted by an absolute particularity that should spring from a potential aspect of his own being. Hence, in God, the one and the many are equally ultimate, which in this case means absolutely ultimate. End quote. Second, Christianity has, as Van Til states, quote, the epistemological presupposition of revelation, end quote. All facts being created facts, factuality can only be understood in subordination to God. But to understand factuality, man needs a norm, and this scripture provides. These two presuppositions give a standard of judgments which, applied to the psychology of religion, leads immediately to certain conclusions. First of all, Van Til asserts the Christian theist will not seek for the origin of nature of uh, or, or, or nature. Hmm. 
pointing at the ship. First of all, Van Til asserts the Christian theist will not seek for the origin or nature of religion in historicism in a, quote, search for the absolute particularity, end quote, in an attempt to establish a native witness for religion. In an attempt to establish a native witness for religion in the particular historical person in isolation from and independent of God. Second, neither will the consistent Christian seek his knowledge in an impersonal eternalism as the alternative to the, quote, blind alley of the absolute particular, end quote. Such a course is, as Van Til points out, a flight from the one blind alley into another. Third, neither is there any solution to be found in a mixture of temporalism and eternalism. Blindness added to blindness gives no sight. This course takes reality as it is, as it is. This course takes reality as it is, as ultimates, and answers no questions concerning the permanent. Oopsie daisies. Oopsie daisies. Oopsie precious. This course takes reality as it is, as ultimates, and answers no questions concerning the permanent and the changeable, the historical and the eternal, the particular and the universal. These three points are again stated by Van Til in another aspect. First, the method of abstract description is denied. This is merely historicism and involves a metaphysics of temporalism. Second, rejected also is, quote, the method of explanation that seeks for a norm in abstract universals which are thought of as eternal, end quote. And third, quote, we will not follow We will not follow those who seek for a combination of description and explanation by seeking to find the universal as well as a particular in the temporal stream. End quote. Van Til's approach involves, first of all, the concept of God as absolute personality and the standard of human thought. The standard. And the standard of human thought. Man's thinking is analogical to God's thinking. Man does not live independently of God, nor does he live independently of the humanity of which he is a member. His individuality is real, but it is dependent and part of a whole. And his witness to God is not independent and na na native. 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 And his witness to God is not independent and native, but is based on the presupposition of God. Since God is the ground of man's being and man's thinking must be analogical, then it follows that man's witness to God must be reflective. Since God has created man as a harmonious unity, the feelings cannot be set in opposition to the intellect, although the answer will be in the direction of rationality rather than irrationality. Moreover, since the frame of reference is always to the absolute God, it follows that all religions cannot be true, but only that which recognises God and uses him as its standard of religion. Thus, the native religious consciousness cannot be accepted at face value, but only in terms of its reference to the one true religion. Second, God having spoke, having Jack Spera, Jack of the Spera, God having spoken in Scripture, the Scriptures must be used to determine what is true and false. Quote, God had to make himself known externally in order that the sinner might know him at all. Oh, 
Hush camper quaffer. In order that the sinner might know him at all, end quote. The psychology of religion has, according to Van Til, followed general psychology in what he so aptly calls its steady trend towards quote, integration into the void, end quote. 19th century general psychology, associationism, was Cartesian and characterised by intellectualism and atomism and a belief that the mind of man is independent of God. 20th century psychology has furthered the revolt against Christian theism by wiping out, quote, the borderline that separated man from the beast and the beast from the inorganic world, thus reducing man to a focus of action and interaction in the sea of an ultimately thus reducing man to a focus of action and interaction in the sea of an ultimate irrationalism end quote first came the rebellion against the intellectualism of associationism from Van Til's perspective this was potentially healthy in that biblical faith equalises all aspects of man's personality, but the dethroning of the intellect was not done for theistic reasons, but to promote irrationalism. Second, the new psychology reacted against the separation of the soul from the body. Again, Vantil recognises the potentially theistic value of this step, but not when its purpose is to wipe out the distinction between soul and body. Third, the new psychology gave particular emphasis to child psychology, whereas the older was almost an adult psychology which treated children as miniature adults. The intellectualism of the older view could do no justice to the individual, whereas the new, by emphasising the emotional and volitional in man, inevitably emphasised individuality. The Christian insists on justice being done to the emotional and volitional as well as the individuality of man, but only in terms of the image of God. The new psychology, according to Van Til, holds to an ultimate activism, with personality viewed as man's self-accomplishment rather than the creation of God. As Van Til observes, I observe I need drink water. Hello. Here's a minute, you local fool. <laughs> Quote, According to the Christian view, then, variability can mean only that man's personality is not fully developed when created, but grows into the pattern set for it by God. The activity by which personality realises itself is, to be sure, very genuine and significant, only because it acts before the background of the plan of God. The integration of personality, that is, the constant readjustment of the particular and the universal within itself, and the constant readjustment of the whole personality as an individual to the universal, found in the universal beyond itself, takes place by a more ultimate and constant readjustment of the individual together with his surroundings to God, who is the absolute particular and the absolute universal, combined in one ultimate personality. The integration of personality, according to the Christian view, is an integration toward, and by virtue of, an ultimate self-sufficient. and by virtue of an ultimate self-sufficient personality. In contrast with this, the modern concept of the integration of personality is an integration into the void. We can best appreciate this if we note that the concept purpose itself has been completely internalised. Did I say concept purpose? I I don't know what that I don't know I don't know don't understand that. End quote. Fourth, the decline into irrationalism saw next the emphasis on the unconscious. The adult is to be interpreted in terms of the child, 
and both adult and child are to be understood in terms of unconscious drives so that the whole of conscious life is made largely subordinate to man's unconscious life. Reason and intelligent purpose are underrated or undercut. Here again, the Christian can see potential good in this step. Since man was created a character, in part conscious and in part unconscious, all his life was directed toward God. Responsibility is not merely on the conscious, but on the unconscious level. Man's childhood is related to his maturity, his subconscious life to his self-conscious life, and in the whole of his life he is responsible to God, the absolute personality. The whole of his life needs therefore to be understood in terms of creation and his status as an analogical personality. The Christian view of the subconscious emphasises responsibility Secular psychology undercuts or negates responsibility with its concept of the subconscious. In a world of ultimate chance, man cannot be a responsible being. Responsibility and chance cannot coexist. In Van Til's incisive... Incisive. Come on, incisive, let's go. In Van Til's incisive words, quote, The real reason why modern psychology has been left no room for responsibility is found in the fact that it has taken the whole of the human personality in all its aspects, self-conscious and subconscious, and immersed it in a... Oh, I hate that. and immersed it in an ultimate metaphysical void, man cannot be responsible to the void. Hence, the only way in which we can establish human responsibility is by showing the ultimate irrationalism of all non-theistic thought, of which modern psychology is but a particular manifestation. In that way, we place man self-consciously and subconsciously in every aspect of his person before the personality of God, Man is responsible in the whole of his personality, but only if he is the creature of God. Man, before God, is the only alternative to man in the void. End quote. Because modern psychology moves steadily in the direction of integration into the void, it is not surprising that the fifth step is the study of abnormal psychology. This again is not without value and has thrown light on both normal and abnormal behaviour. But the fact of such study is not as important as the reason for it, that is, the assumption that both, quote, normal, end quote, and, quote, abnormal, end quote, are both natural and hence normal. It is the denial of any norm. It is the attitude that led Kinsey to define the six types of sexual activity as masturbation, spontaneous nocturnal emissions, petting, heterosexual intercourse, homosexual contacts, and animal contacts without any distinction between them, all being natural and equally normal. This is an insistence on integration into the void, a refusal to face the fact of God and the fact of sin. The sixth step into the void is in the study of the soul of, quote, primitive, end quote, I think I'm going to cut it off there because we're getting a little bit late in the day. And what we'll try to do the next one is finish this chapter off and uh, do a shorter chapter as well. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Tuning in to the radio show. Um, Yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, If you want to support this work, share it, like it, comment. And if you want to support this work financially to help pay for things like nice microphones and um, insulating tiles and... um, Replacement headphones and uh, all that kind of stuff, which is pretty necessary, um, and training, which I need. Uh, then you can go to nathanteacher.com and click on donations, and that would be great. Okay, thanks. God bless. <laughs>